Uh, a good evening to those who are in uh, this part of the world, Africa, and uh, in other parts of the world, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is already the Sabbath of the Lord, and uh, we rejoice in his blessings. And uh, I have seen it fit that uh, I may go through something that has come to my attention, and that is uh, the dispute of uh, the year AD 31. And so this is a two-part series on AD 31 Vindicated, and uh, pray for me as I go through this. There is uh, some material to cover, and uh, I just pray that uh, the Lord will give us the mind to be able to comprehend these things and be able to defend the things that uh, we say we believe as a people, as Christians, as those who are waiting for the coming of Christ. And so I'd like us to pray and uh, go to the presentation. Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for an opportunity to be able to share your word. I understand that uh, I'm weak and I'm insufficient in these things. But Lord, you have said that you will give us the spirit to enable us to be able to speak, even to remember those things that we have to remember at the time that they are needed. And so Lord, help me to remember and if there be anything that uh, you want to teach us, for there are so many things that we are to be taught, I pray that uh, my spirit may be humbled, that you may teach me as I present this message to the people in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is AD 31 Vindicated. And uh, at this point, what we are looking at is uh, what uh, I may term the putting together the pieces of Daniel 9 prophecy as this is the first presentation of two-part presentation of Edith that one vindicated and uh, I'll try to piece together the Daniel chapter 9 prophecy and uh, you know it has become fashionable for people not to believe in the word of God or to criticize or question everything that they are hearing. And so there are uh, some two brethren who have been publishing documents rejecting AD 31, crucifixion in favor of AD 30. In this adjustment, one has ended up determining the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to be uh, 2030. And uh, this will have needed no written document or uh, a video in such, but uh, because I have been involved both privately and somehow publicly, I have seen it fit that uh, I should try to cover some material and compile together something and uh, present it and see if it is plausible and it is acceptable. And if it is not acceptable, take what you believe it is the truth and uh, discard that which you don't believe it is no truth. I just want to remind us that uh, we have a greater work to do, but uh, in a short time, and if all our energies will be consumed in answering doubts, then we will lose focus and never finish it. But again, when we have to do this, it should be brief and we should continue in the spirit of Nehemiah that uh, there is a work that we are doing and then we cannot come down to this. Uh, I love the writings of Sister White and uh, in 4BSG, and that is uh, page 10, paragraph 1. I'll try and go there. 4BSG 10.1 just uh, to look at something uh, for BSG 10.1. 
and uh, I'll try to put it on the screen that uh, we may be able to share uh, together. This is what we are taught. I saw that the people of God must put on the armor and arouse. Christ is coming and the great work of the last message of mercy is of too much importance for us to leave it and come down to under some falsehoods and misrepresentations and slander as the messenger party has fed upon and has scattered abroad. Truth, present truth, we must dwell upon it. We are doing a great work and cannot come down. Satan is in all this to divert our minds from the present truth and the coming of Christ. Said the angel, Jesus knows it all. In a little from this, their day is coming and will be judged according to the deeds done in the body. The lying tongue will be stopped. The sinners in Zion will be afraid and fearfulness will surprise the hypocrites. And so why should I take the pains to be able to go through this when she says that we should be dwelling on the present truth? Now, when uh, you go to early writing page um, 63, Paragraph two, early writing, uh, page um, 63, paragraph two. This is what uh, we read from paragraph one and paragraph two. I saw the necessity of the messengers, especially watching and checking all fanatism, wherever they might see it rise. Satan is pressing in on every side and unless we watch for him and we have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole armor of God, the fiery darts of the wicked will hit us. There are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is the present truth that the flock needs now. I've seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. But such uh, subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is, establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to the glorious future. This I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. And so why come with Edith at one? Because Edith at one is part of the 2300 day prophecy and if we miss the edit that one then we may not have the 2300 day prophecy and then we shall be thrown off the judgment investigative judgment or and all these kindred uh, doctrines that uh, accompany this and so in the book of jude in the book of jude that is this is where we read what we read Jude, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should honestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so, let us see if uh, this edit that one can be vindicated or it cannot be vindicated and if we can uh, defend the faith once delivered to the saints. Now, I I'd like us to look at this, um, this picture, the pre predicted coming of the Messiah. And this is the uh, prophecy of the 2300 days, but uh, the Daniel chapter 9 prophecy is cut off from the greater prophecy of the 2300 days. Uh, this is an image created by uh, Brother Adrian Evans in 1998, and I'm using it fairly, uh, uh, I think so. And so uh, I just like to tell to say that so that no one can may say that uh, I am the one who came up with this one. We have the 490, uh, uh, that is 40, uh, 70 weeks, uh, cut off from the great prophecy. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. 
And you see that these periods are divided into the 62 weeks, and then we have the seven weeks. Um, and so I understand Adventism and the people of Adventists know that in 457 BC, the prophecy of restoration, really uh, the commandment in Ezra chapter 6 verse 14 and Ezra chapter 7 verse 1 was uh, a really put the wheels of that prophecy and it is full restoration was realized. And in 457 BC, it marked the beginning of uh, the 70 weeks. And so we have the seven weeks of Jerusalem being built and being restored. And then uh, uh, until 408 BC, then we have 69 prophetic weeks, that is 483 literal years. And uh, first of all, we have seven weeks and then we have 62 weeks. That is the rebuilding uh, and restoring of Jerusalem. That is um, the seven weeks, uh, 49 years. Now, this you find the seven weeks are 49 years. But then if you go to the book of John, just let us go to the book of John for a minute. Um, the book of John. And uh, this is what uh, the Jewish tell the Jews tell Jesus Christ. In John chapter 2, verses 20, then said the Jewish, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? And this is one of the points that have made people not reconcile uh, Daniel 9 and what the Jewish are saying, because in Daniel chapter 9, it says seven weeks, which are 49 years. But here, in John, the Jew says that 40 and 6 years. So you ask yourself, where are the three years lost? Where are the three uh, years actually lost when you come back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 25? The, the temple was built in 46 years, as John says, but the three years were used to restore the priesthood and uh, to appoint the sacrifices and to have the sacrificial system in place and the judicial system in place. And it took three years. You can go through the book of Ezra and you shall see that Ezra chapter 8, Ezra chapter 9, and Ezra chapter 10. And when you go to the book of Nehemiah, it was not only the building of the temple, but the whole restoration of the religious and the civil uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the civil restoration, the, the religious and civil restoration of the nation of Israel after the Babylonian captivity. And so after the rebuilding for 46 years, there was the three years that actually uh, was used for this. And then this brings us to 49. And then from that point, 408, we have 62 weeks. Um, that is until uh, the coming of the Messiah. Uh, and then uh, his baptism, the anointing in uh, River Jordan. In 4 BC, Christ is born, and in AD 27, at the age of 30, he is Jesus uh, is baptized. And you can check that in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Then we are told that um, his ministry lasted for three and a half years. In some places, you will find that it lasted for three years. Nonetheless, you will take John the Baptist doing the work for six months and then Jesus Christ being able to do it for three years and it is called Jesus' ministry. Uh, and so in AD 31, actually, you find that Christ was crucified and then uh, uh, we remain with uh, in the midst of the week. That is, and then we have AD 34 when Stephen was torn in Acts chapter 13 and the gospel went to the Gentiles. Then we are left with 1,810 years of the 2300 prophecy, which brings us to 1844 in the autumn, uh, 22nd October, when investigative judgments begins. But then I'll um, be able to go slowly through this. I just wanted to show this picture and you can keep it in mind. You can ask it to be shared from Brother Adrian Evans, or I can share it for fair use. But then let us try to bring this to 
something that uh, uh, can be broken down and be understood? Can we really understand these things? And so one thing that uh, we have to know is um, what Sister White says in uh, our higher calling, page uh, 332, paragraph 5, that, um, and uh, I, I think I can put this, our higher calling, 332.5. Um, let us see this. Our higher calling, 332.5. And uh, give me some time that I may be able to bring this. There's something that uh, we are encouraged here. Our higher calling, 332.5, we are told, our minds must be prepared to stand every test and to resist every temptation, whether from without or from within. We must know why we believe as we do, why we are on the Lord's side. The truth must be, the truth must keep watch in our hearts, ready to sound an alarm and summon us to action against every foe. The powers of darkness will open their batteries upon us and all who are indifferent and careless, who have set their affections on their earthly treasure and who have not cared to understand God's dealings with his people will be ready victims. No power but a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus will ever make us steadfast. But with this, one may chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight. So when we have the truth, we can be able to accomplish that which is much. And counsel to writers and editors uh, in uh, page... Um, From page 39, paragraph 1. Counsel to writers and editors, page 39, paragraph 1. Why should we be presenting this thing? The fact that there is no controversy or agitation among God's people should not be regarded as conclusive evidence that they are holding fast to sound doctrine. There is reason to fear that they may not be clearly discriminating between truth and error. When no new questions are started by investigating investigation of the scriptures, when no difference of opinion arises, which will set men to searching the Bible for themselves to make sure that they have the truth, there will be many now, as in ancient time, who will hold to tradition and worship they know not what. I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there are men who now preaching to others who will find upon examining the positions they hold that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance. And then she says, and there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe, but until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they'll be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Certain it is that there has been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to man, putting human wisdom in place of divine. And why do I have to read all this? Um, I like to urge our churches to arise and the church members, the laity, to be able to question what they believe and be satisfied. I'm not saying that uh, we should now throw what we believe, but we should investigate and have a fully understanding of what we believe so that when such a temptations like um, doing away with AD 31 and the 2300 day prophecy arises, we may know uh, what we believe is truth and we have not followed after cunning fables. And so in Daniel chapter 9, we are told 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And so when you read Daniel chapter 9, you have a feeling that um, there is a period determined upon Jerusalem. Now, there are people who have said that uh, this is literal days. Think about literal days that uh, 70 weeks are determined. And 70 weeks, that is uh, 70 times 7, that is... Um, um, 49, uh, actually, uh, 490 days. That is it, 490 days. Now, that is like a year and a half. This is in building Jerusalem. Remember, they had to go back to their land. They had to build that temple. They had to collect the materials and rebuild the temple. They had to uh, 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 um, be able to set in the sacrifices and the the religious and their civil uh, uh, state. And uh, it is not logical for that to happen within one and a half years, seeing that uh, even in Ezra chapter 8, when Ezra examined the people who had been in Babylon, he found no priest. And when you go to Ezra chapter 9 and Ezra chapter 10 and Nehemiah chapter 13, you find that these people had married wives from the nations that were strange, and so there was a need of cleansing. In the book of Haggai 1 and Haggai 2, we are told that they were unclean and they could not participate in making the sacrifices. For Haggai is told to ask of the priest, the law of the priesthood. If a person touches unclean thing and comes and touch a holy thing, will they still be defiled or will they still be clean? And the law of the priest said that it shall be unclean. So the people needed to be cleansed first before they participate in bringing the materials of building or building the temple and also uh, setting up their religious services. And the priests were not there. They were contaminated. And so this, the building and the collection of the material, logically, it could not even happen in 490 days. Think about that uh, because they were in Babylon and they had to start from somewhere. And so the plausible uh, uh, um, way of looking at it is to look at it as 490 years. And this is in connection with the 2300 days because look at the 2300 days, that is uh, three and a half years and the things that had to happen in Daniel chapter eight, which... 490 or 70 weeks are cut off. And you see that uh, under the 2300 days, actually we have the judgment going on, the coming of the Messiah, the, the tackling of uh, the, 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 the Medo-Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire, which actually, when you look at uh, the Medo-Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire, they didn't last for three and a half years. They lasted a long time, and Daniel, the 2300 days, are dealing with the Medo Persian Empire because you find that uh, Babylon had passed off the scene in uh, Daniel chapter 5. And so there came Medo Persia, which the 2300 days deals with. And then we have the Grecian Empire, uh, and then we have the Roman Empire. Don't, don't forget that, where actually the little horn attacks the sanctuary, and then we are told after 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And so we are dealing with the three empires, medo -Persia, we are dealing with the, the Grecian Empire, and we are dealing with the Roman Empire. And these empires did not take three and a half years to last. It was a span of many years. And this time prophecy 
after the little horn trembles upon the sanctuary, the sanctuary also is restored, not only under the Jewish dispensation, but under the Christian dispensation. Because we have the little horn in it is pagan faith, and then pagan Zimbabwe, which is papal state. And this goes beyond the three and a half years. And so we find in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, that God gave Daniel's people 70 weeks to end their sin and rebellion against him. But if they ignored this warning, then God will reject Israel as his chosen nation. And the end thereof will be desolation. And we know that uh, in, this four, in these 70 weeks or 490 years, if you like to take it as years, we find that the abomination and the desolations were done under the pagan, paganism. Way years beyond three and a half years. And they destroyed Jerusalem again in AD 70, long time after this prophecy. And so we cannot take the 70 weeks or the 490 to be literal days per se. I am just trying to prove that they are not literal days before I vindicate actually the 31 AD. And so when Bible prophecy is symbolic, the proven and established day for a year principle applies. And uh, you can check that in Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34. So Daniel's 70 weeks, 490 days is actually a literal 490 years. Daniel 9.25 informs us that these 70 prophetic weeks began with the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. <clears throat> and so the, this well-known starting date for the decree to rebuild Jerusalem was given by Ataxes in 457 BC in uh, Ezra 7.13. Remember, this date was also the beginning of 490 years God gave Israel to end their rebellion and so the 490 years probation period ended in AD 34 where the Jewish ceased to be God's chosen people and um, Daniel 9 24 and 25 informs us the Messiah will be anointed after a total of um, 69 that is 7 plus 62 of these prophetic weeks when it had passed that is uh, Counting from 457 BC, you will find that the anointing happens in 27 uh, AD in the baptism of Jesus when he says that uh, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And before he says that, John, while baptizing him, says that I never knew him, but he who sent me to baptize him said, he who will, you will see the spirit resting upon him like a dove, he is the one. And then Christ says in Luke 4, 18, that the spirit of God is upon me, for he has uh, anointed me uh, to preach to the poor and to announce the year of liberty. And uh, this was exact year Jesus was baptized in AD 27 by John and the Holy Spirit anointed him for his ministry. And uh, the Greek word for messiah means the anointed one and so we know this can only be the fulfillment of daniel 70 week prophecy that the messiah would appear in AD 27 and so um looking at uh, a small map here or a small chart i like us again to revisit something we have here the 457 BC, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem in Ezra 7, 1 to 27. We have 70 weeks of Daniel 9, 24, 490 years, 69 weeks, and then the 70th week where he will confirm the covenant for one week. But in the midst of the week, he shall be cut off. And so in the midst of the week, we have the three and a half on the side of Christ and the three and a half on the side of the disciples because in the midst of the week he was cut off. And then uh, uh, the gospel is preached unto the Gentiles and we have the dark ages of 1260 years. We have the Justinian uh, Emperor, uh, Emperor Justinian's decree in 538 which actually kickstarts the 1260 uh, days of uh, papal supremacy and then Pope Pius the uh, this is Pope Pius the sixth uh, 
he is taken into captivity and wounded and died in captivity in 1798. And this whole process of 2300 days brings us to 1844. And so what else can we glean from this? In the midst of the week is half of seven days, uh, being, of course, three uh, queen five or three and a half prophetic days. And so the Messiah comes from the scene in AD 27, works with John the Baptist for three and a half years. And then in the midst of week, which is AD 31, he is cut off and the temple veil was rent from top to bottom. You can look at Matthew 27, 51, which signifies the end of sacrificial system. By his own death, Jesus caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The remaining three and a half years brings us to the end of the seven weeks and the Jewish probation. The disciples labored mainly for the Jewish during those three and a half years. And in AD 34, the 70 weeks ended when Stephen was torn after the immense speech before the council in Acts chapter 7. The Jewish had rejected the gospel message and so they were no longer God's chosen people. And thus the gospel began to go to the Gentiles. And uh, uh, Paul speaks something during this transition. Paul speaks something so important during uh, uh, this transition in Acts, uh, in Acts, Acts chapter, Just let me give you a reference in a minute. Acts chapter 13, verses 46. During this transition, this is what Paul says as he is anointed as uh, the preacher to the Gentiles. He says, that, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourself and worth of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And then uh, when Stephen is being stoned in Acts chapter 8, verse 34, not Acts 8, 34, but um, in Acts, Acts chapter Acts chapter 7, but he, from verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. What is the significance of somebody starting? How is it different from sitting? Because when uh, you go to Daniel chapter 7, throne was set and uh, the ancient of the day took his seat and the son was brought before him and he took also the seat and the books were opened and the judgment began. So the sitting, when the court sits, the judgment starts. Just as in the normal courts, when uh, the court sits, actually the judgment begins. When the court stands, a verdict is made. And so this is the significant significance of seeing Christ standing on the right hand of God. And he is standing at the stoning of Stephen, which means that uh, actually a verdict has been made and a judgment has to be executed. And so this idea, we get it from Isaiah, Isaiah 3, 13. In Isaiah 3, 13, we read, the Lord standed up to plead and standed, standed to judge the people. So when he stands to plead, he stands to judge the people. And that is what is being brought up in the book of uh, uh, Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter, we saw in the book of Acts chapter, chapter 7 verses 55 and verses 57. And so one of also the issues that 
has been raised and arises, there are different opinions on who the people of the prince refers in Daniel 9.26, but the majority of scholars, however, do agree that the destruction of the city and the sanctuary applies to the second destruction of Jerusalem and uh, the rebuilt sanctuary by Roman armies under Prince Titus in AD 70 AD. And so remember the 70 weeks are 490 years uh, was the time God gave his chosen nation to end their rebellion where they will then be forgiven for their transgression. Now, note that Jesus references this prophetic time period while uh, conversing with Peter on the topic of forgiveness, that forgive how many times? 70 times 7, of course, 490 uh, in Matthew 18, 21. He tells Peter, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? This is the question. Till seven times, verse 22 says, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, this is profound. This is just another hint of the Daniel 9 prophecy of 490 years where the Jewish had wronged God and a reconciliation had to be made. Jesus alluded to this to get something into the disciples' mind, but it was not comprehended or understood fully. And so, uh, Daniel 9.25 states that from the decree to rebuild the temple until the Messiah means anointed one, which can only be Jesus, is seven weeks and three score in two weeks. Then the people who argue that the prince is the enemy and not Jesus Christ, the prince which makes the covenant for one week and in the midst is cut off, the people who argue that um, it is the enemy. The, the, the real question will be, since when did uh, uh, the enemy make a covenant with the people and then for this period that is alluded here and then be cut off not for himself but for the people again in the midst of it. You will look in the historical books but um, you will never get this. And so they had to anoint Jesus Christ the Messiah. They had to anoint the Prince of Peace. But because they rejected, only what followed are abominations. There is no way abominations and desolation could have followed if the making of the covenant was with the prince who is the enemy. Because in making the covenant with the enemy, then it means they could have agreed with him and there will no other enemy will have come to destroy them. And so I believe <clears throat> that it is true to say the prince in Daniel chapter 9 is the same prince in Daniel chapter 8 who is making peace with his people to restore them, to restore the sanctuary truth which had been trampled down. But then, instead of accepting the prince of peace, they rejected him. And when they rejected him, look at um, uh, what Jesus Christ was able to tell them in the book of Luke. Uh, He tells them that uh, they had not known their time of visitation. In Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, by refusing the Prince of Peace, this, what, this is what will happen to them. Uh, first of all, from verse 38, says, saying, Blessed be the king uh, when, when he's coming to uh, Jerusalem and when he was come nigh even now at the descent of the Mount Olives I mean the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty work that they had seen now this is uh, I believe the triumphal entry saying blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest and then and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him Master, rebuke the disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if this should hold their peace, the stones will immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Why should he weep over it? Because he was the prince of peace, but he could not be uh, welcomed in that city. Saying, if thou hadst known, even thou at least in this day, 
in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thy enemies shall cast a strange about thee, cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not live in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that saw therein and them that bought. And then in the book of Matthew, uh, in the book of Matthew, he tells them this in the book of Matthew chapter 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophet, 2337, and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often will I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her children, uh, even as her, a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you will not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And so the rejection of the prince culminates in the rejection of the people. And so the prince in Daniel chapter 9 is not the enemy, but the prince of peace, whom they could not accept it. And uh, uh, we are told again, um, and I like to put this on. We will not have this man rule over us. This is in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 14. Luke 19, 14. Now, this is a story that uh, Jesus gives us a parable. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Very interesting. But, this, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And so you have the story. And what I wanted is that uh, we will not have this man reign over us. And so they rejected the Prince of Peace and at last they were rejected. And so, uh, so how do we get the year of baptism to be 27 AD before we even reach to AD 31? When it states Jesus was about 30 years old, when the time of this was first calculated, there was an era of four years made as many uh, uh, will know. Herod was still alive when Christ was born and did all he could to try and kill Jesus at that time. But history records Herod's death to be in 4 BC. After the era was recognized, the historic facts became even clearer. Jesus was born in 4 BC and then baptized in 27 AD at the age of 30. And so, uh, we, we, with those facts, we, we, we can notice that uh, the uh, prophetic period of uh, Daniel chapter 9 actually does not just only deal with years, uh, days, but years. Now, again, in uh, Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 15, you read the gospel says that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, it is interesting when Jesus Christ says the time is fulfilled. The burden of Jesus Christ was to show the time prophecies. And there was no other time prophecies, prophecy of uh, the prediction of the coming of Christ than the, four, the, the 490 or the 70 weeks. That is the time that he was talking about. The time is fulfilled. There is no other time given in scriptures predicting the coming of the Messiah. 
what is this time that is fulfilled that Jesus speaks of here in Mark 115? Um, we find uh, some interesting commentary from Adam Clark's commentary on Bible. Uh, he says, that is the time appointed for sending the Messiah and particularly the time specified by Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 27. And so let us look at the subdivisions of uh, the 70 weeks. When you look at the time prophecy itself, the angel now relates to Daniel the event which is to mark the beginning of the 70 weeks. They were to date from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Not only is the event given which determines the time of the commandment of this period, but also those events which take place at its close. Thus, a double test is provided by which to try the application of this prophecy. But more than this, the period of 70 weeks is divided into three grand divisions. One of these is again divided and the intermediate events are given which were to mark the termination of each one of this division. So if we can find a date which will harmonize with all these events, we have beyond a doubt the true application for none but that which is correct could meet and fulfill so many condi conditions. So let us try to find out these events and their timing, uh, how they happen. Uh, the beginning of the 70 weeks, the beginning of the 70 weeks, that is where we, we can start in determining these subdivisions. And uh, I'd like us to look at these uh, pieces together. If you need uh, uh, the presentation, the manuscript for presentation, feel free to give me a message or to comment on the video links, both on YouTube and Facebook, and I'll be able to send you the paper. We now inquire for the initial date which will harmonize with all these particulars. The command respecting Jerusalem was to include more than mere building. There was to be restoration. By this, we must understand all the forms and regulation of civil, political, and judicial society. When did such a command go forth? At the time these words were spoken to Daniel, Jerusalem lay in utter desolation and had thus been lying for many years. The words were spoken to Daniel, Jerusalem lay when they were being spoken, the restoration pointed to in the future must be it is restoration from this desolation. We then inquire when and how was Jerusalem restored after the 70 years captivity. There are four events which can be taken as answering to the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. These are one, the decree of Cyrus for the rebuilding of the house of God in 536 BC in Ezra 1, 1 to 4, the decree of Darius for the prosecution of that work which had been hindered in 519 BC, Ezra 6, 1 to 12, the decree of uh, uh, Texas to Ezra 457 in Ezra 7. Then we have the commission to Nehemiah from the same king in his 20th year, that is 444 BC in Nehemiah 2. So if we take these dates, we can try to fix in the years of 490 and see where it brings us and see the remaining years and see if they bring us to the autumn of 1844. Without a shadow of doubt, the only date that brings us to that is 457 BC. That is what only brings us to 1844. So dating from the first two of this decrease, that is uh, 536 and 519, the seven weeks or 490 literal years will fall many years short of reaching even to the Christian era. Besides this, this decrease had reference principally to the restoration of the temple and the worship of the Jewish, not to the restoration of their civil state and polity, all which must be included in the expression to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. These two decrees made a beginning of the work. They were preliminary to what was afterward accomplished, but of themselves, they were altogether insufficient to meet the requirements of the prophecy, both in their dates and in their nature. Thus, falling short, they cannot be brought into the discussion as marking the point from which the 70 weeks are to begin. The only question now lies between the decrees which were granted to Ezra and to Nehemiah, respectively, and that is number three and number four. The facts between 
The facts between which we are to decide here are briefly this. In 457 BC, a decree was granted to Ezra by the Persian emperor Ataxes Longimanus to go up to Jerusalem, which as many of his people as were minded to go with him. The commission granted him an unlimited amount of treasure to beautify the house of God, to procure offerings for its services and to whatever else might seem good to him. It empowered him to ordain laws set magistrates and judges and execute punishment even unto death, in other words, to restore the Jewish state, civil and ecclesiastical, according, ecclesiastical, according to the law of God and the ancient customs of the people. Inspection has seen it fit to preserve the, this decree and a full and a full and accurate copy of it is given in Ezra 7. This decree is recorded not in Hebrew, like the rest of the book of Ezra, but in the official Chaldaic or Eastern Aramaic. Thus, we are referred to the original document by virtue of which Ezra was authorized to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Thirteen years after this, in the 20th year of the same king, year of the same king, 444 BC, Nehemiah sought and obtained permission to go up to Jerusalem in Nehemiah 2. Permission was granted him, but we have no evidence that it was anything more than oral. It pertained to him individually, since nothing was said about others going up with him. The king asked him how long a journey he wished to make, and when he would return. He received letters to the governors beyond the river to help him on his way to Judea, and an order to the keep of the king's forest for timber. When he arrived at Jerusalem, he found rulers and priests, nobles and people already engaged in the work of building Jerusalem. That is in Nehemiah 2.16. They were, of course, acting under the decree given to Ezra 13 years before. Finally, after arriving at Jerusalem, Nehemiah finished in 52 days the work he came to accomplish in Nehemiah 6.15. Now, which of these commissions, Ezra's or Nehemiah's, constitutes the decree for the restoration of Jerusalem, from which the 70 weeks are to be dated? It hardly seems that there can be any question on this point. Reckoning from the commission to Nehemiah in 444 BC, the dates throughout are entirely disarranged. For far for, from that point, the troublous times which were to attend the building of the street and wall did not last seven weeks or 49 years. If we reckon from that date, the 69 weeks or 483 years, which were to extend to the Messiah, the prince, will bring us to AD 40. Now, AD 40, Jesus Christ had already died. The probation to the Jewish people had already closed. So, but Jesus was baptized in Jordan, and the voice of the Father was heard from heaven, declaring him his son in AD 27. So, again, the decree of Nehemiah cannot be that decree. The others fall short of the years, and then the one for Nehemiah is just beyond. According to this calculation, the midis of the last week or seventh week, which is marked by the crucifixion, is placed in AD 44. But the crucifixion took place in AD 31, 13 years previous. And lastly, the seven weeks or 490 years dating uh, from the 20th year of a Texas will extend to AD 47, which absolutely nothing to mark the, with absolutely nothing to mark the termination. Hence, if that be the year and the grant to Nehemiah's and the grant to Nehemiah, the event from which to reckon, the prophecy has proven a failure. As it is, it only proves that the theory to be a failure which dates the 70 weeks from Nehemiah's commission in 20th year of a Texas. So uh, there is um, this decrease that are way beyond, uh, are way falling far short, and the other one which is going way beyond also uh, and so it is thus evident that the decree granted to Ezra in the seventh, seventh year of Artexas in 457 BC is the point from which to date the 70 weeks that was the going forth of the decree in the sense of the prophecy the two previous decrees were preparatory and preliminary to this to this indeed they are regarded by Ezra as part of it the tree being taken as one great whole. For in Ezra 6.14 we read, 
they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxas, king of Persia. So he is putting the whole thing together, but the dating now is not on the previous dates, but in 457, which is the final restoration. It will be noticed that the decrees of these kings are spoken are all as one. The commandment margin decrease singular number of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxes, showing that they are all reckoned as a unit. The different decrees being but the successive steps by which the work was accomplished. This decree could not be said to have gone forth as intended by the prophecy until the last permission which the prophecy required was embodied in the decree and clothed with the authority of the empire. This point was reached in the grant given to Ezra, but not before. Here, the decree assumed the proportions and covered the ground demanded by the prophecy, and from this point it is going forth, must be dated, that is 457 BC. Now, how many of the subdivisions? The harmony of the subdivisions. Will these dates harmonize if we reckon from the decree to Ezra? And so let us see. Our starting point then is 457 BC. 49 years are allotted to the building of the city and the wall. On this point, Reduke uh, Pridux says, in the 15th year of Darius Notas ended the first seven weeks of the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy. For them, the restoration of the church and the state of the Jewish in Jerusalem and Judea was fully finished. In that last act of reformation, which is recorded in the 13th chapter of Nehemiah from the 23rd verse to the end of chapter, just 49 years after it had been first begun by Ezra in the seventh year of Artaxas Longimanius. This was in 408 BC. So far, we find harmony. Let us apply the measuring rod of the prophecy still further. 69 weeks or 483 years were to extend to Messiah the prince. Dating from 557 BC, they end in AD 27. What event then occurred? Luke thus informs us. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And praying the heaven was open, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Luke 3, 21 and 20, 22. After this, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. Then in Mark 1, 14, 15, the time here mentioned must have been some specific time, definite and predicted period. But no prophetic period can be found terminating then except the 69 weeks of the prophets of Daniel, which were to extend to Messiah the prince. The Messiah had now come and with his own lips announced the termination of that period, which was to be marked by his manifestation. And so this is amazing to find that uh, the synoptic gospels also uh, agrees with this, and this is indisputable harmony. There's nothing to dispute in this prophecy. These Jewish ordinances that uh, they had been given pointing to the death of Christ will cease at the cross. They, there they did virtually come to an end when the veil of the temple was rent at the crucifixion of Christ, though the outward observance was kept until the destruction of Jerusalem in uh, AD um, 70. And so, in this last segment, I want to try to connect the date of the crucifixion in connection to the Passover to determine AD 31 if um, we can get the harmonies that it is in AD that one. And so the first Passover is recorded in John chapter 2, verses 13. As just we end at the last segment of this presentation. Let us try to connect AD that one. Let us see, does do the Passovers really match with uh, the prophecy itself and the termination of it. In the, the first Passover is recorded in John 2.13. This was the first Passover after Christ's baptism. 
The second is mentioned in Luke 6, 1, John 5, 1, third in John 6, 4, and the fourth, which was that at which he was crucified, John eleven fifty five, and John 13, 1, from which it appears, one, that our blessed Lord continues his public ministry about three years and a half, according to the prophecy of Daniel 9, 27. Looking at the Passovers, the way they happen, they take um, they happen in the space of three and a half years. And two, that having been baptized about the beginning of his 30th year, he was crucified precisely in the midst of his 33rd. At his baptism, when he ended on his ministry, the Passover had taken place some time before this one because the Passover happened on 14th of Abib, which corresponds to March, April. And at the time of baptism, it was in the autumn, which would correspond to October, probably not far from six months. A careful study on the Gospel of John also reveals that Jesus did preach for three and a half years, just as Daniel's 70-week prophecy revealed, as it states Jesus was cut off in the midst of the final seven years. Since Jesus was crucified at the Passover, which was observed in the spring of the year, then his baptism would have to be in the fall of previous year, thus three and a half years following 27 AD brings us to 31 AD. I'd like us to notice this point carefully, that um, according to the prophetic period of Daniel chapter 9, uh, it reveals that Jesus Christ was cut off in the middle of the seven, final seven years. And so since Jesus was crucified at the Passover, which was observed, in the spring of the year, then his baptism would have to be in the fall of previous year. Thus, three and a half years following 27 AD brings us to that one AD. The second Passover is in John 5, 1, and the fourfold gospel commentary has this. Though every feast in the Jewish calendar has found some someone to advocate its claim to be this unnamed feast, Yet the vast majority of commentators choose either the Feast of Purim, which came in March, or the Passover, which came in April. All the commentators pretty unanimously regarded it as the Passover, while the letters let, let cool favor the Feast of Purim. John 4.35 locates Jesus in Samaria in December, and John 6.4 finds him on the shores of Galilee just before a Passover. If then this was the Feast of Purim, the Passover of John 6, 4 was the second in Jesus' ministry, and that ministry lasted but two years and a fraction. But if the feast here mentioned was a Passover, uh, uh, then the one of John 6, 4 will be in the third, will be the third Passover, and the ministry of Jesus lasted three years and a fraction. Since then, the length of Jesus' ministry is largely to be determined by what the feast was. It becomes important for us to fix the feast, if possible, that it was not Purim. The following arguments may be urged. One, Purim was not a mosaic feast, but one established by human laws. Hence, Jesus will not be likely to observe it. Although we, we have the Hanukkah, which actually Jesus attended, and somebody may be able to uh, um, to to dispute that you can say that Jesus could not attend other feasts which were not uh, in his calendar. So true, we find him at the feast of dedication, which was also of human origin, origin, but he did not go up to attend it. He appears to have attended because he was already in Jerusalem in John 10, 22. Here, the pregnant just uh, just a position of feast and went up indicates that Jesus was drawn to Jerusalem by this feast, but Purim was celebrated by the Jewish everywhere and did not require that anyone should go to Jerusalem, as did the three great festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. It was kept in a boisterous, riotous manner and was therefore not such a feast as Jesus would honor. It came early in the year when the weather was too rigorous and inclement for sick people to frequent the porticos, that is um, uh, the part of that uh, uh, section of the altar of burnt offering. It did not include a Sabbath day. As Purim was just a month before the Passover, Jesus would hardly have returned to Galilee before the Passover in John 6, 4, unless he intended to miss the Passover, which he would hardly do for the sake of attending Purim in Jerusalem. And so, 
uh, uh, those contending that it was not the Passover present several arguments which we note and under as follows. Since John gives the name of other Passovers, he would have named this also had it been one. But the conclusion is inferential and not logical, and the other is to be twofold. First, perhaps John did give the name by prefixing the article to it and calling it the feast for being the oldest, older than the law and the Sabbath, and most important of all feasts. It was rightly called by preeminent the feast. Since the Sinaitic manuscript gives the, the article and calls it the feast, the manuscript authority for and against this reading is pretty evenly balanced. Second, if John did not name it, there is probably this reason for this, his silence. Where he names the feast elsewhere, it is thought that the incidents narrated take color from or have some references to the particular festival location which is named, but there is no such a local color and failure to name the feast prevents mistaken attempts to find such a, a local color. Again, it's objected that if this is a different Passover from John 6, 4, then John skips a year in the life of Jesus. He probably does so skip, and this is not strange when the supplement supplemental nature of his gospel is considered. In favor of it being the Passover, we submit two points. Daniel seems to forecast the ministry of the Messiah as lasting one and a half, one and a, one half of a week of years. It fits better in the chronological arrangement for in the next scene we find the disciples plucking grain and the Sabbath question is still at full heat, but the harvest season opens with the Passover. So what feast then is this? No question has more divided the harmonies of the Gospels and the duration of our Lord's ministry may be said to hinge on it. For if, as the majority have thought, until of late years it was a Passover, his ministry lasted three and a half years, if not probably a year less. Those who are dissatisfied with the Passover view all differ among themselves what other feast it was. In some of the most acute things, there are no grounds for deciding. In our judgment, the evidence is in favor of being a Passover. In several excellent uh, manuscripts, the article is added, he eroth, the feast, the grand, the principal festival. A Petavius or Petavius supposes that the feast of Purim or Lords is here meant, and one MS reads, H. Sihonifgia, the feast of tabernacles. Several of the primitive fathers believe the Pentecost to be intended, and they are followed by many of moderns, because in John 7, 2, mention is made of Feast of Tabernacles, which followed Pentecost and was about the latter end of our September. And in John 10, 22, mention is made of the Feast of Dedication, which was held about the latter end of November. And see Bishop Pierce, Calmet, uh, uh, See Bishop Pierce. Calmet, however, argues that there is no other feast which will, which all the circumstances marked here so well agree as with the Passover. And Bishop Newcomb, who is of Calmet's opinion, thinks Bishop Pierce's argument concerning the succession of the feast to be inconclusive because it is assumed, not proved, that the three feasts which he mentioned above must have happened in the same year. See much on the same subject in Bishop Newcomb's notes to his. Harmony in page 15. And so there are a lot of conjectures on uh, what kind of feast is this, but there are a lot of evidence also that um, this was the second Passover of Jesus Christ's ministry. Then um, we have the third Passover, which is mentioned in John 6, 4. This happened about 10 or 12 days before the third Passover, which Christ celebrated after his baptism. Um, um, during that time lapse. And then we have the fourth Passover, which is in John 11 and John chapter 13. And so looking at uh, the various commentaries on uh, the Passovers that lasted in Jesus Christ's ministry, as you go through the Synoptic Gospels, you find that he went through the four Passovers. And it is in this fourth Passover that he was crucified, meaning that he participated in three Passovers. Uh, and uh, for you to have three Passovers, you must have three years. 
because a Passover happens each year. And so uh, it is in this fourth one that actually he was uh, uh, crucified and uh, uh, marking um, the three and a half years of his uh, ministry. And so um, we can argue about Daniel chapter 9 whether it be literal days or whether it be years. But when looking at uh, the prophetic period there or the, 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 the 70 weeks given there, it, it cannot include the uh, the whole prophecy of the 2300 de uh, days, which covers the medo persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Little Horn or the Roman Empire, and it is two phases. And so 490 is cut off from 2300 days. And when you start dating it from 457, actually as the 2300 days starts, you come to the year of baptism of Jesus Christ, which is in AD 27 at the age of 30, because in 4 BC he was born and he reached 30 years in 27 AD. Three and a half years of his ministry brings us to 31 AD and not 30 AD. We may they then set this down as a fixed date. This being in the middle of the last week, we have simply to reckon backward three and a half years to find where 69 of the weeks ended. Because if you try to backdate three and a half years from 30 AD, you will come to 26 AD and not 27 AD because if going forth becomes going forward becomes a problem then we can date these things back and see if they fit in 457 because they have to fit in 457 and then uh, they have to fit also in Christ being baptized at the age of 30 and dying at the age of 33 because Luke says at the age of 30 he was baptized now, if you backdate, you will come, if you backdate from 30 AD, you come to 26 AD. And then you will have Jesus Christ um, actually being born in 5 BC and not 4 BC. But if you backdate from 31 AD, three, uh, three and a half years will bring you to AD 27 and it will bring you to the birth of Jesus Christ in 4 BC. And also it will bring you back to the year of 457 BC. Thus going back three and a half years from the crucifixion in the spring of AD 31, we come to the autumn of AD 27, when as we have uh, tried to see the 69 weeks ended and Christ began his public ministry. Going forward from the crucifixion three and a half years, we are brought to the autumn of AD 34 as the grand terminating point of the whole period of the 70 weeks. This date is marked by the martyrdom of Stephen, the formal rejection of the gospel of Christ by the Jewish Sanhedrin in the persecution of his disciples and the turning of the apostles to the Gentiles. These are the events which one would expect to take place when that specified period are uh, cut off for the Jewish and allotted to them as a peculiar people should fully expire. And so, um, this is the part one of proving that one AD. And because the 70 weeks are cut off from 2300 days, we shall see if we pick 30 AD, uh, where will the 2300 days reach us? And if we pick that one AD, what will the 2300 days reach us? And that will be uh, something to look at as we provide more material on uh, uh, on Daniel chapter 9 and uh, the book of uh, Daniel chapter 8. Otherwise, may the good Lord continue to bless us. And uh, I'm inviting us to study what we believe. Because Seventh-day Adventism is under attack. And it's not under attack from the people who are outside. It is under attack from the people who are inside. People who are, as I may say, backsliding from the faith once given to the saints 
and now they want to uh, see if Adventism can stand or it cannot stand. But by God's grace, I know that the Lord will raise up his people who shall understand the Bible and be able to give it in a clear, distinct tones, a trumpet sounded in a way that will not confuse the army, but encourage the army to move forward. Otherwise, the Lord bless us, and uh, may we be encouraged this Sabbath. May we continue drawing closer to the Lord as he draws closer to, to us. And uh, uh, I believe that um, the Lord uh, will continue blessing us as we study his word and uh, as we approach him to know even how to defend the truth once delivered to the saint. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this day. Thank you for your grace and thank you for the Sabbath. Lord, we just pray that in this Sabbath, as you have promised your blessings, a twofold blessing, that Lord, you may visit us once again, that we may learn how to sit under your presence and uh, be educated by thy son. And so grant us this opportunity of worshiping you in truth and in spirit. And uh, in wherever, whichever place that we have been lacking, Lord, fill us once again. Give us a heart of flesh that we may learn of thee more and more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And may the good Lord bless you until let us meet in AD 31 Vindicated, part 2 of 2. And looking at the remaining portion of the 2300 days, which the 490 days was cut from. Bye for now.